From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello. This is a great program to our listeners. It you is. I just want to mention that David Feldman, our co-host, is off again this week. So security is the theme for today's show. We're going to talk about, in the context of the military, and also about potential cyber warfare against our energy grid. First up, we welcome award-winning journalist Andrew Coburn, who writes about defense and national security issues. In fact, in the Reagan era, he uncovered the hollowness of the so-called Soviet threat and finds that today's threat inflators have equally little regard for the truth. This has become significant in the last few weeks with the renewed tensions between the U.S. and Iran. The article in Harper's, though, that attracted Ralph's attention is entitled The Military Industrial Virus, How Bloated Defense Budgets Gut Our Armed Forces. Now, personally, I'm always struck by how presidential candidates every four years talk about rebuilding our military, which makes me curious about when it actually fell apart, especially since we spend more money on it than the next 10 or 12 countries combined. And regular listeners know that Ralph is always pointing out how the Pentagon budget never gets audited. Well, Mr. Coburn makes the counterintuitive case that the more we spend on the military, the weaker we actually get. So we'll find out what's behind that paradox in the first half of the show. In the second half of the program, we turn our attention to cybersecurity. Some of you may remember a few years back when we interviewed renowned TV journalist Ted Koppel, who had written a book about the vulnerability of our electrical grid and how if it were attacked, it would be very hard to find out where that attack actually originated. So on the program today, we welcome cybersecurity expert Joel N. Gordis to see if that situation has improved at all in the intervening two and a half years. We'll find out why he is not a fan of our so-called smart technology. As always, we will take some time out in the middle to check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. And if we have any time at the end, we'll try to answer some listener questions But first, let's find out how bloated defense budgets gut our armed forces. Andrew Coburn is a journalist who has been covering defense and national security issues since the height of the last Cold War and has published numerous books on these topics. Now he's the Washington editor of Harper's Magazine and the author most recently of Kill Chain, The Rise of the High-Tech Assassins. His latest article in Harper's is entitled The Military Industrial Virus, How Bloated Defense Budgets Gut Our Armed Forces. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Andrew Coburn. Hey, it's great to be with you. Indeed, Andrew. And uh, I want to uh, caution our listeners not to be so overwhelmed and discouraged by what you're hearing. And consider just three things in order to understand what Andrew Coburn is writing about. One is that a control of Congress can turn a lot of this horrific military budget and the vicious spiral it's in around. Second, that the military budget has not been audited for decades. They had a preliminary one that cost $400 million a year ago, but it still hasn't met the congressional test for a full audit. And the third is when you hear the kind of mega billion dollar figures Andrew's going to point out about these boondoggle weapon systems, think of all the schools that could be renovated, all the highways, buildings, bridges, public transit can be upgraded or constructed in your communities. Think of the sewage and water systems that can be improved and made more safe in terms of drinking water, because the drain of the military budget, which is 53% of what the Congress spends every year, is leading to the wreckage of what they call our crumbling infrastructure. Okay, so as you know, Andrew, President Dwight Eisenhower not only coined the phrase military industrial complex, but he also gave a speech in April 1953 before the National Association of Newspaper Editors in which he was the last president to say that X number of tanks is equivalent to Y number of schools that aren't being renovated and the kind of list that I just pointed out. No other president has done that intermodal comparison. And now comes your great article, The Military Industrial Virus, How Bloated Budgets Gut Our Defenses. Namely, a massively wasteful defense is also a weak defense and a reckless defense. Tell us the thesis of this article that appeared in Harper's Magazine, which 
listeners should read if they don't already. Well, I certainly hope they do. And the basic thesis is that, as I said earlier, it's counterintuitive. You'd think, well, at least the more money spend on defense, the you know, at least the stronger, more militarily stronger, for better or worse, we are. But that is, in fact, not the case. I compare the whole defense establishment, the military, industrial, congressional, academic intelligence complex, two think tanks thrown in. I really compare that to the, it's like a sort of giant parasite, a virus, as we say in the title, that exists only to grow, feed itself and grow. And the point is that when you wave around, you know, 700 and whatever it is, 700 and $19 billion now, this year, for the defense budget. I mean, people, there's a, a kind of a gathering rush of eager people, eager to help themselves with that money. And they do that by, you know, offering and proposing to build and building weapon systems that are so loaded down, so gold plated, so sort of unwieldy, but they don't actually work very well. They always propose to build you know, a wonderful fighter plane that'll be able to, you know, do all sorts of amazing magic things, be invisible, take on 20 enemies at once. So the Congress approves that and they say, we're going to build a thousand of them or two thousand of them. And then turns out that that's A, you know, never turns out to work that well and B, that they tend to break, they break down all the time. And thirdly, they can never, even with the bloated defense budget, they can never build as many as they said they were going to because they're so, the cost overruns are so huge. You see, you end up with a much smaller force, a smaller number of planes that, as I say, can't do the job. And so the militarily actually inexorably shrinks. And, you know, amazing as it may be to your listeners, our military is actually shrinking, despite these unprecedented budgets. You mean in terms of weapons, but not in terms yeah. of presence, in terms of the American empire with bases in over 100 countries and operations in a dozen countries. Well, right. I mean, we have these bases all over the place, but first of all, they, you know, the ones that, and we have these actually by past standards, pretty small wars for which they, you know, which consume an enormous amount of money. I mean, I argue that, you know, people generally, and, you know, people like you and me, progressive minded folks say, oh my gosh, we have this, you know, people tend to say, and it's always, it seems obvious, we have these bloated defense budgets because we have all these foreign wars, these, you know, these overseas engagements. We need to cut them out. Well, we certainly do need to cut them out. But it, I think people get it the wrong way around. I think I'm arguing, in fact, it really is the case. We have these foreign wars because of the bloated defense budgets. You know, they are there to justify the budget, not the other way around. That's an important fact for people to understand. That's right. In fact, there was a Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, that once said, we have all these weapons. What good are they if we don't use them? Remember that one? I certainly do. I uh, know. But here, here's something really fundamental, listeners. You know the old phrase, things got to get worse before they get better? Well, actually, I've got all kinds of examples where the worse things get, the less they get better. Staggering increases in drug prices, for example. Staggering increases in military equipment per plane or per toilet seat. Here's an example in Andrew's article. Three decades ago, some of you may remember, there were press disclosures that the military was paying private corporations $435 for a hammer and $640 for an aircraft toilet seat. Now, that really drew all kinds of public outrage and satire on the TV shows. And people at the Pentagon told me it was the most disturbing revelation in their lifetime. Not the huge price overruns of major weapon systems, just the toilet and the aircraft toilet seat and the hammer. And then later, in 2018, it was disclosed the Air Force was paying $10,000 for a toilet seat cover alone. and it gets worse. The Air Force official explained that the price was required to save the manufacturer from, quote, losing revenue and profit, end quote. That's quoted in Andrew Coburn's article. And there was almost no outrage. In other words, when things get so bad, it pummels the American people into cynicism leading to withdrawal. 
Now, what is the way out of this, Andrew Coburn? Would you start with Congress military budget watchdog groups back home? Would you start with the Congress? Isn't that where it can be stopped? Because that's where the money is appropriated from. Absolutely. You know, Eisenhower in his famous speech in, you know, goodbye speech in 1960, when he talked about the military industrial complex, originally, as he wrote the speech, he was going to say military industrial congressional complex, because that's what it is. And for whatever reason, he left out congressional when he made this, actually delivered the speech. So it really, we should start with the Congress. We should, you know, tell all these congressmen, you know, who there needs to be citizen outrage that we're pouring out all this money for, you know, as I argue in the piece and $10,000 toilet seat covers and that, and you have to remember that, you know, these multi-billion dollar weapon systems are really assemblages of equally overpriced small parts. Tell us, by the way, what the F-22 fighter plane started out in terms of its cost per plane and what it ended up. Well, I think it started out something like a, a mere a mere $89 billion from memory, and it ended up as over, I say, $400 billion. Actually, I think I underestimated it. They always do this. It's called buying in. You're going to get this plane or the ship or whatever for, you know, absurdly cheap price, just a few million dollars, and then, you know, end up the taxpayer, if they look closely, find out, as in this case, they paid $400 billion and up for this fighter plane, which actually, you know, was a good example. They were going to buy... I can't remember, 750 of them originally, and they ended up having to sort of stop at 187 because the thing was just so expensive. They wouldn't have been able to pay the general salaries, which... Of course, this is what happens when this huge budget has no auditor. The Government Accounting Office of Congress has been waiting. The Pentagon's been violating federal law since 1992 and not submitting a fully audited budget. Then you get all kinds of massive waste. And, you know, sometimes I think, Andrew that the military contracts are really laughing at the American people, basically saying, you can't do anything. We got Congress in our pocket. We show yeah. how in every congressional district, almost there are jobs relating to the Trident submarine with subcontractors of the F-22. And we've got that information conveyed to every senator and representative. You have to know what they actually called that 400 and fifty dollar claw hammer you can get in a hardware store for ten bucks. You know what the contractor called it in the what? invoice? No. Here's what they called the claw hammer that you've got in your hardware box, folks. A unidirectional impact generator. Oh my god. <laughs> in order to get four hundred and fifty bucks from your pocket, taxpayers, they're laughing at you. And Trump was laughing at you. And he wanted another, and he got over $80 billion, with a B, dollars added to the Pentagon budget in his first year as a selected president that the generals didn't even ask for. They were stunned. And a majority yeah. of the members of the Congress voted for it, including a heck of a lot of Democrats. So it comes back yeah. to 535 men and women in Congress. You know how to control them back home, folks. You know how to demand that they come back to your town meetings where you have experts on the military budget, interrogate them, and demand to know why they are misusing your tax dollars, getting us into a whale of a trouble overseas, and draining the amount of money that you sent to Washington from rebuilding your communities with good-paying jobs that can't be exported to China. To what extent, Andrew, is this virus you talk about spiraling toward total disaster with more and more cost overruns, to use the euphemism, more and more devouring our country's necessities with a military budget that's creating more and more boomerangs abroad that you and your late brother, Alexander Coburn, wrote about. Well, that's right. It's getting, you know, it's, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's especially insidious because, you know, people have been bludgeoned into accepting it. You know, they don't complain as much as they used to. There isn't the outrage now that we used to have at when occasional revelations of how big the ripoff is. But it's worse in lots of ways. Not only is it taking away more and more vital resources, which are, you know, as you said, really needed for schools, for health, for so many important things, 
but it's infecting, as I say in the article, infecting other areas of the economy. And, the, you know, the great example is the Boeing Corporation. Well, you know, once a great corporation that produced great civilian airliners, you know, very safe, economical, everyone around the world wanted to have them. And then they became more and more of, they've become more and more of a defense company. So now it's run by people who've come out of the defense industry. Now the civilian planes are starting to look like military planes. I, they're vastly overpriced. They went over budget. They, you know, come in the market years late and it turns out they're badly designed you know, as you know very well. I mean, it's a very horrifying, I trace the disaster that we're hearing about with Boeing right now, right back to their basically becoming a defense company, a total defense company. I thought that comparison is very well taken. They're using the reckless lack of budgeting and engineering precision that has gotten them in trouble. We're talking to Boeing now with the defense department, like on their fuel tanker, and with NASA on their spacecraft that has moved over into their civilian passengers like the deadly Boeing 737 MAX and its two crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia. And the system is totally out of control. And the real question I think we have to ask ourselves, are enough people in every congressional district? Let's start with a dozen. You know, there are universities, colleges, there are experts everywhere who used to work in the military industry, used to work in the Pentagon, patriotic former colonels, procurement specialists, they're everywhere. And enough of them can become watchdogs of the Pentagon at these military budget review town meetings, which you can call. Who's going to be the first listener to organize the first one? Well, why don't you give us examples of a few of the members of Congress who are really actively challenging the military budget that you wrote about in your article in Harper's Magazine. You know, I, I talk about Ro Canna, for example, from the San Jose area in California. I mean, he's done a very good job of really mobilizing support in the Congress, in the House, particularly against this, you know, particularly egregious, this genocidal war in Yemen that we're engaged in. Of course, I didn't mention how I should have, but Barbara Lee, the great Barbara Lee, from Berkeley. I mean, she always consistently <laughs> votes against the defense budget, as you know, as your, the rest of them should too, because it's outrageous. There are the progressive caucus in the House is, you know, slowly taking this up. I wish, you know, they, I know they got lots of other issues on their mind and so forth, but I wish they really would focus on this because this is what's destroying every other possibility of, you know, spending money the right way. The, the, demands of the defense budget. But the problem is, I mean, this year, the in the budget, you know, the Democrats arguing about, you know, the budget they were going to put forward, the progressives, they originally wanted to go for a cut in the defense budget. And the so-called centrists, I'm afraid my editor stuck in the word centrist. I wanted to call them the corporate right wing of the Democratic Party. Correct. They said, no, they fought back and they managed to, you know, wipe out any notion of a cut. They're basically giving Trump what he wants. Andrew, tell us about the original Pentagon whistleblowers, which got quite a bit of publicity. Ernie Fitzgerald, the first one, and Chuck Spinney. These are military analysts. Nobody questioned their credentials. What did they tell us? Well, right. Well, Ernie Fitzgerald, actually, he was a very great man. I mean, sadly, he passed away this year. He was the one, originally, he got fired on the direct orders of Richard Nixon for exposing the fact that a particular boondoggle, the C-5 transport plane was, at that time, it seemed it was a lot of money, $2 billion over budget. And for revealing the truth of what this was actually costing, you know, you and me and every other taxpayer, he got fired. The president said, you know, fire that. Well, I can't repeat on the air what Nixon actually said. And Ernie, he sued and got his job back. And he was the one, he revealed, he was the one who brought to our attention the original, the notorious toilet seat and the hammer, because, you know, he only understood that the way to alert people, certainly at that time, to, you know, the enormity of what was going on was to point out something, what well, we were paying for something everyone knew the price of. Everyone knew that you shouldn't pay more than, you know, 10 bucks for a hammer or whatever it might, you know, a similarly small amount for a toilet seat. So when they heard it was, you know, paying $600 and up, everyone, everyone, every citizen could understand that, you know, what an outrage that was. And he used to say, 
that you know they have to understand that a you know a hundred million dollar fighter plane is just a lot of you know toilet seats and hammers <laughs> or the you know small parts overpriced small parts flying in close formation uh, and that was Ernie he you know he was a brilliant guy and a wonderful patriot a, a real a great American True. and then and Chuck, Chuck Finney, Finney Chuck you know he was a Pentagon analyst and Chuck figured out he started he was the first very person to really understand and explain in a very sort of precise way that you know this whole business that the more we spent and the more ambitious the technologically ambitious you know these weapons designs became you know what i was saying earlier that the you know that meant we ended up with a smaller military force because you know he figured out he tracked all the numbers historically and found out that you know, when they proposed, you know, to buy a thousand super duper planes or whatever it might be, that we always ended up with far fewer that broke down all the time, that couldn't be, you know, were too expensive to replace. So they got older and older and then broke down more often. So he, this was a very awkward, he called it defense facts of life. And he didn't get fired for that. They just sort of didn't give him anything to do. So he sat in the Pentagon for years and years writing actually brilliant critiques of what was going on, where our money was really going. I mean, And he's still writing. Know, Look him up on Google, Chuck Spinney, S-P-I-N-N-E-Y. I'm glad, yeah. by the way, Andrew, we're talking with Andrew Coburn, who wrote in the current issue of Harper's The Military Industrial Virus, How Bloated Budgets Got Our Defenses. I'm glad you retrieved Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur, very prescient quote in 1957 about the Pentagon and their corporate contractors always inflating threats. And here's what he said, quote, always there has been some terrible evil at home or some monstrous foreign power that was going to gobble us up if we didn't blindly rally behind it by furnishing the exorbitant sums demanded. Yet in retrospect, these disasters never seem to have happened, never seem to have been quite real, end quote. So let's start an experiment, Andrew. We are heard widely in the Berkeley, San Francisco area. That's a, considered a hotbed of progressivism. So I'm telling our listeners, if you want to start the first town meeting where you ask Barbara Lee, your congresswoman, to come and answer questions about her position and the position of Democrats and Republicans she knows so well in Congress after so many years, Here's what we'll do. We'll send you a list of questions, if you would like, that she could take back to Congress and spread around to the Progressive Caucus, which she's a member of, and Nancy Pelosi, who comes from San Francisco and rarely challenges the military budget. She's the speaker. Would you be willing to provide some questions if we get a call from Berkeley and go to Nader.org or go to ratsreformthecongress.org as to how to sure. establish these demands for town meetings. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's a great idea. It's a great idea. Yeah, we we get really, one uh, model, and we can get it underway. And I think it'll get a lot of press, too, especially in the Bay Area. And it could be replicated all over the country. So, okay, Berkeley activists, that's what you're noted for, huh? Marches, petitions, mobilization, rallies. Let's do one for the USA on the runaway military budget. I don't know if you were aware that retiring Admiral Hyman Rickover, you know, 60 years in the U.S. Navy, often called the father of the nuclear Navy, testified one last time before the Joint Economic Committee, chaired by Senator Proxmire, who used to really go after the waste in the military budget and never got anything but support back in Wisconsin, by the way. It actually strengthened his political position where he almost never had a credible opponent. And what he disclosed, Rickover, was amazing. He said, I, I wish I could sink them all, he said. He said, there's so much rapacity in the contracting business of naval shipyards by these corporations that we should have a shipyard owned by the U.S. Navy to provide a yardstick. Do you remember that testimony, Andrew? Yeah, he was great. Remember, he said 
the way one way another way he would reform the Pentagon was to get everyone in it in the Pentagon in the building to go outside and form two circles an inner circle and the outer circle and he would then fire the outer circle he was full of those kinds of metaphors and he hated the greed of the shipbuilding industry in particular and he wanted a competition from a US owned naval yard the congress didn't listen to him by the way if any of you want a copy of the paperback that printed the final testimony before the Joint Economic Committee of Admiral Hyman Wickover, just contact us and we'll send you a copy. It's a good piece of testimony to start your summoning your members of Congress to town meetings on the military budget. I think you could also probably get Ben Cohen, who once hired a bus, went all over the country to try to educate his fellow citizens about the bloated military budget, how it's connected with empire, and how it depletes budgets for community rebuilding of the infrastructure, I think he would come out to such a a hearing as well and support you. So we can send you copies of this reprint of Admiral Rickover's final testimony where he laid it all out. What else would you like to tell our listeners about your research, not just in this article, Andrew, but other writings that you've had on this subject, especially why your colleagues in the media don't seem to be writing that much about it anymore. No, it's a sad decline. I mean, you know, it used to be used to be some really good reporters, you know, in the big papers and small papers who would cover defense. But, you know, along with the general decline of the media for all sorts of reasons, you know, they always like to blame the Internet. I blame it on <laughs> On the you know the fact people who people who own the media these days who think they can cut quality and you know make money that way, but yeah there are still some good people. I mean like I don't know just reading pieces um, from the Virginia Pilot, the Navy Times, believe it or not, very good paper. They've been really excellent in covering current disasters in the Navy. What do you think of the Pentagon press corps? All those reporters that oh, don't no, ask I very don't tough they... questions. I don't know what they do all day. Uh, I really don't <laughs> take the, you know, copy out press releases or something. You know, things, I mean, the theme I, you know, always like to get across to people is, you know, how little the people, the generals, you know, the leaders of the military establishment, how little they actually care about fighting, you know, about war, about, you know, I'm mean, not saying, you know, we want them to think about war. Obviously, we don't. But that's what they pretend to do. They say, give us all this money and give us your young men and women because we need to be ready to fight. When everything they do, you know, it goes the other way. And one example I've written about on and off is the issue of something called close air support. Close air support means, you know, soldiers on the ground fighting. They need support from the air. That's what, you know, America has always been sort of big on air power. So they need, particularly in these recent wars, they need aircraft who come and support troops actually fighting on the front line. Well, and we have a very good plane, so happens, to do that, called the A-10, which does it, and it does the job, and the troops like it very much. Well, so the Air Force wants to abolish the A-10. They hate it. The Air Force doesn't like to be involved with, you know, with the Army. They think they might get sort of be made part of the army again if they spend too much time on this. And they just want to be able to buy at least big, huge, fancy, incredibly expensive, multi, multi multi-billion dollar nuclear bombers. That's what they dream of. So they're quite prepared to let, you know, American troops on the ground get slaughtered because they don't have close air support while they go off and, you know, trousers of the money from for buying nuclear bombers. That's a, you know, it's, it's an important fact. You don't have to be in favor of war or fighting or, you know, all that to understand, I mean, to appreciate and be outraged, I think, about the fact that these, you know, they don't care about, you know, the actual business they're being paid for. You know, to broaden this out, there are quite a few retired admirals and generals and high officials who really agree with you and who think right. there's too much waste, too much corruption too much empire. Some of them formed this group called Center for Defense Information, which has been absorbed by POGO, which stands for the Project on Government Oversight. If you can look it up, people, Project on Government Oversight, POGO. And they need to be supported and given a secretariat. And of course, as you know, Veterans for Peace is always 
on the Pentagon budget, waste and corruption, and advocating waging peace instead of constantly preparing and waging wars all over the third world. And their website is veteransforpeace.org. I belong to it. I believe in the organization. And they have chapters all over the country. You can check on their website where there's a chapter in your community, veteransforpeace.org. Before we leave, Steve, I'm sure you have more than one question or comment of Andrew Coburn, who in Harper's Magazine wrote this extremely powerful article, The Military Industrial Virus. I actually do. I have two questions. And the first one refers back to the article. And the next one is a bit of a tangent. But Ralph, you mentioned about Congress, all these defense contractors being distributed across all these congressional districts because the military is a job generator. And Mr. Coburn, you cite a study from the University of Massachusetts Amherst that challenges the idea that the military is such a great job generator. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. I mean, you know, they, as you say, this is always the excuse that you know we need, you know, we need to spend so much money on defense because it does, you know, it brings employment. Well, actually, you know, I won't deny that it brings some jobs, but that study you just mentioned revealed that it's actually a really bad way to generate jobs. You know, for a billion dollars invested, this study showed you get eleven thousand roughly jobs generated in defense, whereas in education, for example, you know, building schools and hiring teachers and all the rest, you get 27,000 jobs. I mean, far greater. And health is way up there. Health is 17,000 jobs. So it's very, you know, it's, it's a fake argument because, yes, it generates jobs. It generates very few. And by opting to spend the money on on defense in the form of a usually useless weapons production program, as opposed to investing in our future, i.e. our children, by by our education, you're actually making a bad jobs choice apart from anything else. That's what can be pointed out at these town meetings back in your district when you summon your senators and representatives. Look at that for a rebuttal, listeners. And your tangent question, Steve? My tangent question has to do with, since you have covered threat inflation, I wanted to talk about the most recent one and and ask you what you know about what's going on with Iran, and are we setting up for another Gulf of Tonkin situation? Well, yes. Oddly enough, I think (laughs) one line of defense against that is Trump himself, who I think is through his addled brain, he does kind of remember that he he promised in his campaign to, you know, to end these foreign wars. And he thinks we might lose him a few votes if he starts a really big one, which is what war would be. No, it's, it's clear that there is no, it's all, it is, I, mean, I hate the term now because it's, you know, it is fake news. You know, these notions, you know, the Iran, signs of Iran getting ready to attack the U.S. Actually, I happen to know there is no hard intelligence of any Iranian plans to attack the U.S. or U.S. forces in the Middle East. Although, I, you know, someone did say, if you're worried about threats of, you know, the possibility of attacks on American troops in the Middle East, very easy to deal with that. You just take and bring them home. I thought it was an excellent suggestion. Mm-hmm. We don't need to be there in the first place. So really, you know, maybe it's, I don't try, it may not happen. I mean, Trump's political instincts may prevent us having another Gulf of Tonkin. On the hand, there are all these, you know, really sort of warped characters like Bolton around him. And I tell you, Andrew, Trump ought to fire Bolton because Bolton is maneuvering around Trump, trying to get him in some sort of fight against Iran, which would be a metastasizing quagmire. And Trump has actually said, John Bolton's trying to get me into a war. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, John Bolton is an infighter. He's a driven warmonger. He knows a lot more about how to get the U.S. into war than Trump does. And the only thing Trump has left is to fire John Bolton. Yeah, let's all call the White House and urge that line of action. Well, we've reached the end of our time, Andrew. Thank you very much for coming on and for being hey. ready to supply a series of cogent questions to be asked of members of Congress at these town meetings back home. And let's hear from you, Berkeley. Thank you very much, Andrew Coburn. Oh, thank you, Ralph. Great to be with you. 
We've been speaking with Andrew Coburn. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Now we are going to step away for exactly one minute to find out what's happening in the world of corporate crime with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. And when we come back, we are going to talk about the state of cybersecurity in the energy sector. How well is our energy grid protected? Don't go away. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Report Morning Minute for Wednesday, May 22, 2019. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Across the country, legions of home caregivers earn a pittance to tend to the elderly in residential houses refurbished as care facilities. That's according to an investigation from Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting. The profit margins can be huge and for violators of labor laws hinge on the widespread exploitation of thousands of caretakers, many of them poor immigrants, effectively earn earning $2 to $3.50 an hour to work around the clock. The federal hourly minimum wage is $7.25. The Center for Investigative Reporting interviewed more than 80 workers, care home operators, and government regulators, and reviewed hundreds of wage theft cases handled by California and federal labor regulators. The investigation found rampant wage theft has pushed a vast majority of these caregivers into poverty. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. How well is our energy grid protected? Our next guest knows more about this than just about anyone in the country. Joel N. Gordas is a military combat veteran who flew over 130 combat missions over Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. He is formerly the president of the Environmental Energy Solutions and the Center for Energy Security Solutions, both energy consultancies involved in multidisciplinary aspects of energy and environment, especially as it relates to security. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Joel Gordas. Thank you very much, Steve. Nice to be with both you and Ralph. Thank you very much also, Joel. You know, listeners, we always talk about informed citizens persuading and educating their fellow citizens down at the village square level. And Joel Gordas is a very good example of that. And recently, he made a presentation at the Winstead Community Bookstore on the question of cybersecurity, starting out saying it's a matter of when, not if, our networks get attacked through cyber warfare. And it so impressed the reporter that the Lakeville Journal put it on as a major story on page one, which is rather unique for a local newspaper. So I want to ask you the first question, Joel. Describe our particular energy grid that you think, and many others think, can be a target of state action like other countries around the world or wildcat action and with spectacularly disastrous results. Describe the grid system and how mutually interdependent it is to give us electricity for keeping our whole society operating day after day. Thank you for the very kind words in opening. And Ralph asked a very good question is what's the nature of the threat? And it's multifaceted. And let me start, though, by answering his question about how is our grid set up right now? And we call it a centralized grid. And this means that it has large units that are very distant from each other. And this is something where you can interfere with it at many points within the transmission, the distribution, and even in some cases on the generation. And it's not easy for it to isolate into certain other areas, although we are beginning to get better through certain technologies. It doesn't provide storage as a buffer, which a decentralized system would be doing. And again, it's these long links between the different generation units. A lot of this information was first pointed out by Amory and L. Hunter Lovins in their book, Brittle Power, way back in 1982. And I pretty much stick by that formula that they gave. It also, by the way, doesn't have easy user controllability at the local level. The control comes from those distant places many miles away. All those add different elements of vulnerability to our grid. All right. So that's the situation now. And describe the electromagnetic type of attack. But before you do that, so people know what the present situation is, isn't it true that China and Russia and others are 
embedding in our system and, and we've got embedding in their system. And that's the prime deterrent, at least against those actors from attacking because they will get retaliated against with the viruses in their systems. But describe the electromagnetic first before you go into the mutual assured destruction aspect. Well, there's, there's many different ways that the uh, grid can be compromised. And when we talk electromagnetic, I think people are talking about electromagnetic pulse. And there's been a great deal of discussion on that lately. The uh, Electric Power Research Institute just came out with a paper poo-pooing electromagnetic pulse. But then Dr. Peter Pry, who headed up a commission on a EMP, as we call it, countered him. So right now it's a he said, she said, even as far as the lethality, let's call it, of electromagnetic pulse. But there are other threats to the grid. And let me go through a few of them because sure. EMP is just one. Of course, we learned with the Arab oil embargoes a couple of decades ago about fuel supply interruptions, and that was a big one. There's also the physical security of the generation, transmission, and distribution of the grid itself and of the transmission and distribution lines as well as generation. Then we have foreign dependency or disruption of globalized supply chains for certain components, things like large-scale step-up transformers, which are needed in a centralized system, sometimes are unavailable because most of them are no longer made in this country, and they're very, very difficult to transport any significant distances. The other interesting thing is most of the lithium that we get for our lithium-ion batteries, which we use for everything now, including electric cars, are basically coming from South America, which has the vast majority of the lithium supplies at this point in time. So that's a weak point in the supply chain. Then we get to the cyber threats, including a number of different forms of cyber threats, everything from embedded codes and foreign sourced components that we get to worms and viruses. And we even put electromagnetic pulse into this category as a cyber threat. Then you can get a blended combination of all those threats. Somebody might do a physical attack and at the same time then do a cyber attack. So that's another one. Finally, one that's sort of new and not in the lexicon as much is adding complexity to an already what we call tightly coupled complex system. And that just means there's more stuff out there. And the more stuff you have, it's the more stuff that can go wrong. So those are your main threats to the electric grid right now. Well, you know, in 2015, Ted Koppel wrote a modest bestseller called Lights Out which focused on impending catastrophe from a cyber attack. And we had him on this program. And he was saying, you know, the Obama administration doesn't seem to get the urgency. And of course, the Trump administration doesn't either. It's like nobody wants to talk about it because it's too horrific. It will just shut down your air conditioning. It will shut down your electric light systems in your home. It will totally immobilize and paralyze and lead into catastrophic traffic congestions, mass transit systems, you know, right out of science fiction. And so as a society, like most societies, we don't like to talk about these horrific scenarios. So let's say our listeners, uh, absorbing what you're saying, Joel Gordis, they say, well, how come it hasn't happened? So it could come from so many different sources, so many different places in the world. It doesn't have to come from guns or bombs. Why hasn't it happened? Well, we have had the incident in Ukraine where the one plant was taken down, and that was sort of a warning shot across the bow. And I would say that there have probably been a number of close calls on it. Who knows? Some of this information may not leak out into the uh, world. Now, that being said, there have been other types of cyber attacks which have actually taken down part of not the electric grid itself as opposed to the actual net itself. And that was there was a major cyber attack against Dyne Corporation, which operates part of the Internet. 
and it froze traffic for some very major companies on their cyber needs. So it's a matter of that's a way in and it's something we have to be aware of. But you're right. It's something that we have not seen. It's something that's maybe a bit on the horizon because you're not going to find a lot of amateurs with the capability to be able to do this. So it's not like certain other cyber attacks. But believe me, the grid is, to coin a phrase, unsafe at any speed. Well, you know, Joel Gordis, you talk about what we can do to mitigate such an attack. And I want you to talk about that. But before we do, what about all these smart homes, smart meters, smart gadgets that almost all the people have in this country? You're saying that that is part of the problem and that you don't have any of these smart gadgets, although the electric companies are forcing households to replace their older meters with smart meters. Tell us about the vulnerability that we all have when we have these smart gadgets in our hands or in our homes? Well, you see, this is exactly what's happening. And right now, we're probably bordering on a trillion smart types of devices one way or the other. And what happens is it's these smart types of devices are the things that can be commandeered and then focused against something like an electric grid in order to bring it down. So that's exactly right, that we need to start saying, hey, let's start getting smart grids up to standards because a lot of the devices that you and I buy can be commandeered to be used against us in this respect. And a lot of them do not even have a place to put in a code that allows only you to be able to control. So if, and you and you were very happens, specific in your presentation. You said Amazon recently admitted that employees listen to customer voice recordings from Echo and other smart speakers. And in recent years, there have been major security breaches reported by Facebook, Google, MyHeritage, Dow Jones, Twitter, Marriott, Lockheed Martin, the Pentagon, and others. So we're talking about just like a preview of what could happen on a national scale here, right from these consumer gadgets. How have you avoided the pressure from the electric companies to put a smart meter in your home? Well, the only problem I have is that I have a small photovoltaic system producing energy for me cleanly to combat climate change. And that would be a semi-smart meter. But the type of inverter that I have as part of the system is pretty good and secure as far as I know. So it's a matter of making sure that the devices that you have have, number one, the capability to be secure, and number two, that you have gone and done everything you could to keep them secure. So those, those are the important things that need to take place. But with, with the proliferation of everything, every refrigerator going out, every television going out with smart capability, nobody's paying attention to this, and all of them can be commandeered. Yeah, you say smartphones, thermostats, security cameras, DVR players, monitors, and other high-tech appliances now commonplace in tens of millions of homes. And so we got a personal stake here. It's not this is we're waiting for some national decision maker. We're all part of this vulnerable situation. So let's say you're in charge of policy here, Joel Gordis. How would you mitigate this? Well, I don't think there's any way now that the genie's out of the box to do a complete mitigation, particularly what's already out there in the field. However, I would be, if I were in Congress or even in a state legislature, find some way to put certain requirements onto what happens when a company sells a product which is capable of being commandeered. And if it is, then basically something has to be done about not allowing them to either put it in place or to recall it and have some work done to make sure that it has the right codes put in place. Your safeguard is you called redundancy and diversity, building microgrids, blocks of microgrids. What do you mean by that? Well, that's a great introduction to uh, the other thing of what we need to do better and stuff, and that is doing microgrids 
as hopefully a panacea to the problem. Now, a microgrid is not the same as a smart grid. A smart grid has made extensive use of smart technology, and so they're often confused. A microgrid has certain characteristics that I sort of went into in a way before, showing that it is separated from the main grid. It has its own fuel supply. It has its own physical security. It is less dependent on those supply chains, external supply chains. And in general, it allows you to cut off from the main grid, but it can reconnect to it for a transfer of power. Now that may happen through smart technology, but you can at least measure it and it may not take place on its own if you so design it to not do so. Joel, you say you get the energy for these microgrids from solar, wind capacity, and fuel cells, which are sort of independent generating right. capabilities. Yes, these are what we call distributed resources. And those are renewable distributive resources. Now, at this point in history, we still will need some fossil fuel driven types of generation, let's say within a microgrid, because we may not have total availability to sunlight or, or other renewable sources all the time. So there will be a, a certain interface. And remember, you're going to have things like police stations and hospitals as part of a microgrid. In fact, they are great starting points because they are high value types of facilities that we must keep running 100% of the time. Joe, before we ask Steve for a question or commentary, where do people get more practical information on this subject and they can connect with other people to get something uh, changed here and more protective? Well, that's, that's a good question, too. And there's a number of books. And I mean, it's as weird as it sounds, one of the books that I still point to as the best is anything by Amory Lovins, Amory and Hunter Lovins and such. And the, the book I mentioned before, Brittle Power, is probably the oldest and still, in my mind, one of the best authorities on what a microgrid might look like. Other than that, we have a whole bunch of other people. Joel Maycower of Green Tech does a great deal of work on this, too. And I will say, by coincidence, Joel Maycower and Amory Lovins and myself were together on 9-11, physically together on that date when they took down the Twin Towers. And I was standing next to Amory, and we're watching the television, watching one of the towers fall. And I didn't ask him anything, but I said, I wonder what's running through his mind. But it is something that has impacted us because it's that type of a disaster that makes you really start thinking about these things. And Joe, is there any citizen groups cropping up here in this area? Nobody is actually doing much. The environmental groups are interested in the environment. And one of the things that does bother me a great deal, and I'm an environmentalist. I've been an environmentalist for decades and decades, and I have the record to prove it. But one of the things that the environmentalists don't do is they don't look at the security aspects. For instance, let's say we go to the all electric in certain ways as, as they want us to, but then certain things become unavailable doing it before time. It's a matter of timing. What comes first, the electric car or the microgrid? If you get everybody into electric cars, but then you do not have an electric system that can actually service them on a day-in, day-out basis because it's vulnerable, is that where we really want to go? The health, safety, and security must be considered. Steve? Yeah. Joel, do you personally feel optimistic about our ability and our will to solve this problem or mitigate it? Well, I have my dark days, no pun intended, in thinking about it, because the repercussions on life, liberty, and, and such are in the balance, to be honest with you. I, and, you know, I don't mean to be overly scary about it and run and cry wolf, but even our state of Connecticut's chief security risk officer 
guy named Arthur House, is very concerned about it. He's become more concerned over the last year and a half, two years, when I follow his writings, and he's a longtime friend of mine and such, and he's talking about the malware and the Russians planting the malware within our electric system. Now, five years ago, Art House was a lot more conservative in his thoughts about that and never would have said that, but he is doing it now. And when Art starts doing it, I get even more frightened about what could happen. Well, as you said, in the Winston Community Bookstore presentation, maybe it will take some sort of cyber attack on a national security level rather than just people warning about it for the public to focus on it. Certainly, there's quite a bit we can do locally as well as nationally. But as usual, it usually takes some sort of major tragedy to wake people up and get them to pressure the decision makers to face up to it. Anyway, we're uh, fortunately out of time. I've been talking with Joel Gordas on cybersecurity, and I hope there are a lot more people like you around the country because you reach regular citizens. And as we know, that's where the changes have to start with. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Ralph and Steve, for the opportunity to get the word out on this. I do appreciate it very much. We have been speaking with Joel N. Gordas. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. I want to thank our guests again, Andrew Coburn and Joel N. Gordas. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. A transcript of this show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. For Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. And Ralph has got two new books out, The Fable, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. To acquire a copy of that, go to ratsreformcongress.org. And to the Ramparts, How Bush and Obama Paved the Way for the Trump Presidency and Why It Isn't Too Late to Reverse Course. We will link to that also at ralphnaderradiohour.com. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. So join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we welcome back healthcare expert Dr. John Guyman, who will talk to us about his new book entitled Struggling and Dying Under Trump Care. Talk to you then, Ralph. Thank you very much, Steve and Jimmy. And let's hear it from Berkeley for the first citizen summons for a town meeting with your own representative from the Congress on the military budget craziness and what to do about it. Hi, this is Jimmy Leewert, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and welcome to the wrap-up where Ralph answers a couple of listener questions. Okay, Ralph, let's do some questions. Our first question here comes from Angel Cabrera, who is a 32-year-old attorney living in South Florida, and he actually has two points he wants to make. He says he's been a listener for a couple of years now and want to wants to thank you for all the work you've done in the past, are currently doing, and all the hard work you will continue to do in the future. And he said he heard on our program on more than one occasion, he heard you lay out the suggested targets that it would require to get your House representative to appear in your district for a town hall. And he wants you to suggest the number of minimum amount of signatures that would persuade his rep to appear. 300 quality signatures will do it, Angel. By quality, I don't mean a scribble on a petition with someone standing at the street corner and they can hardly read the name. I mean clearly written or printed names on the petition with email or other contact information and what occupation or profession the person has. The member of Congress looks at that and they said, oh my gosh, these people are really serious. They represent all kinds of constituencies in my congressional district. I better get there fast. And make sure you have a good auditorium, maybe a city hall or a school auditorium. Make sure you have a few knowledgeable people about the agenda you want to talk about. And make sure you have a video camera. And you'll see what happens when you send that member back to the House of Representatives with your instructions. Second, if you want more details on how to form a Congress Rat Watchers group to Watchdog Congress, go to ratsreformcongress.org, 
ratsreformcongress.org. You'll get a specific tutorial on how to set up these groups. No big deal. You can start small and become very significant in your impact, especially if you represent the public opinion in your district. Thank you, Angel. All right. Our next question comes from Dolores Swan, who has an RN after her name, so I assume she's a nurse. And she says she just bought a zero water pitcher and was told it filtered out fluoride, but does not say so on the box. And when she spoke to customer service, they said it filters fluoride out. She wants to know, does it filter fluoride out from our water? She already owns a clearly filtered, which I guess is another brand, which does claim in writing to filter the fluoride, but the zero water filters by comparison are cheaper. She says, I also don't see anything on their website. Are they not allowed to print that they filter fluoride for some reason? Are these unsubstantiated claims? Well, since I don't know the facts on your particular product that you're talking about, I can't comment, Dolores, but I do know that the Environmental Working Group, that's EWG.org, Environmental Working Group, has a buyer's guide which has a listing of filters that remove fluoride from the drinking water. It's a pretty reliable group. They may actually list the product you're talking about. So I would suggest go to EWG.org. stands for Environmental Working Group.org. They've been working on drinking water safety for many years, and they talk about brand names. Well, thank you for those questions, Angel and Dolores. And that's a wrap. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we talk to Dr. John Guyman and his new book, Struggling and Dying Under Trump Care. Until next week. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting 